Ever since the Resident Evil remake debuted on the Nintendo GameCube almost two decades ago, we've been clamoring for a revamped version of its sequel, Resident Evil 2. 20 years after the game's initial PlayStation release, our prayers have finally been answered. The Resident Evil 2 remake has successfully brought the 1998 survival horror classic back from the dead. But what kind of changes have the last two decades brought to the title? The Resident Evil 2 remake features many of the same general story beats as the 1998 original. College student Claire Redfield and rookie cop Leon S. Kennedy arrive at a decimated Raccoon City. To survive, they must traverse this city, solving puzzles and defeating zombies and monsters. Along the way, they meet a slew of characters, including, but not limited to, the hapless child Sherry Birkin, the secretive mercenary spy Ada Wong, the mad scientist Annette Birkin, and the dastardly homicidal police chief Irons. The biggest differences lie in a more in-depth narrative. The remake elaborates on certain beats or locations found in the original with much, much further detail, and in some occasions takes some creative liberties. You can see some differences right away with the tense playable gas station opening, Don't shoot! Get down! Compared to the original diner cutscene that united our two protagonists. Another example of a story tweak has to do with Leanne's backstory. In the original, Leanne was delayed getting to Raccoon City thanks to a major hangover from some heavy drinking the night before, drowning his sorrows of getting dumped by his girlfriend. Ah, a role model for us all. However, in the remake, Leon never receives his assignment from the police station, leaving him to worry and investigate on his own, as if he's gonna save the whole day by himself. You know, so he went from a naive, irresponsible Leon to a naive, overzealous Leon. Another change? This time around, Ada Wong claims to be an FBI agent and manipulates Leon into accompanying her deep into the Umbrella facility. FBI. It's a much more believable cover-up than the old looking for my boyfriend excuse. Minor characters have been fleshed out as well. For example, journalist Ben Bertolucci is now jailed by Chief Irons and begs to be released as Mr. X tracks him down, rather than imprisoning himself out of fear. There are far, far more narrative expansions found later in the game that we don't quite want to spoil, but what narrative changes did you like or hate the most? Let us know below. A big change to the remake is how you experience that plot. Resident Evil 2's original zapping system is gone and the order-specific campaign scenarios have sadly been downgraded. With the zapping system, your game would change based on who you chose to play through the story as first and actions you took during your initial campaign. For example, taking a specific item in Claire A would mean it wouldn't be available in Leon B. The A scenario's narratives were also vastly different from the B scenarios. For example, Mr. X only showed up in the B scenario for either character, which had huge implications on the plot like with Ada's death. This resulted in four similar but distinct unique campaigns packed into Resident Evil 2. For the remake, Claire and Leon have minorly altered campaigns based on order played and the zapping system is absent. The B scenario is now known as Second Run, with its most notable changes being the true ending, an altered beginning portion of the game, a new six shooter, and the location of a few minor items. Overall, it features far fewer differences from the first run when compared to the changes in the 1998 originals A versus B. However, with the remake's more fleshed out narrative in general, this seems like an understanding compromise. And uh, side note, you know, two campaigns and characters is great and all, but I really wish we could have some real-time character switching back and forth like in Resident Evil Zero. With no zapping, you may be worried about other modes being absent from the remake. But hunk fans, don't fret. Everyone's favorite Umbrella Security Service Special Agent makes a triumphant return. Just like in the original, the canonical fourth Survivor minigame puts you in the role of the Umbrella operative as he makes a frantic run through the city to escape with virus samples. And hey vegetarians, the Tofu Survivor, a similar mode where the delicious protagonist is armed only with a knife, makes a return as well. I gotta say, that tofu has never looked better. Graphics don't make the game, but they certainly help with immersion. And Oh boy, have graphics improved. We won't go too in-depth on the many, many technical differences, but jumping from 5th generation games to the current 8th generation is like a quantum leap in graphics improvement. The Resident Evil 2 remake looks absolutely gorgeous. Don't get me wrong, I find the original polygonal look to be unbelievably charming, and still terrifying, but the PS1 just doesn't quite visually compare to its great-grandchild. All environments in the remake received a huge, detailed upgrade, and the RPD feels much more like a real police station because of it. All characters went through visual changes as well. Besides an updated uniform, Leon's hair now matches his Resident Evil 4 appearance, but he's super fresh-faced and looks like a little baby cop. Just please, please keep Ashley out of this. Leon! Help! Sorry guys, my Ashley impression is pretty terrible. Many will undoubtedly miss Claire's red hot pants, but for the remake she decided to go with a slightly more practical option of jeans. As an added bonus, they even gave the lucky gal some sleeves. Well, at least for part of the game. Now don't worry purists, the classic costumes are still available to unlock for free. Little Sherry Birkin's new iteration is inspired by the character Newt from the 1986 James Cameron sci-fi horror action classic masterpiece, Aliens. 
They mostly come at night. Mostly. Ada Wong's red dress is absent at the beginning of the game. Instead, she starts off looking like a real spy with her sunglasses and a discreet beige coat. I don't know, I'd argue that blatantly dressing like a spy is pretty suspicious when slinking about. Thankfully, halfway through the game, the red dress is revealed from under her coat in all its impractical glory. Of course, monsters have received a makeover as well. Enemies like zombies and lickers return looking even more gruesome than ever, literally dripping with detail. Zombies are also more diverse, encompassing different sizes, races, and ages. Most importantly, Mr. X now has a fedora. So I guess this is to make him blend in more, you know, make him look less tyranny, but you know, the psycho eyes, gray skin, and hulking body kind of gave that away umbrella. And this time around, Mr. X is far more efficient at stalking, relentlessly following you into seemingly any corner of the RPD. With all of the updated photorealistic graphics, there's no way the developers would keep that giant corny alligator in the game. Oh. Fans initially believed no new enemies would be introduced in Resident Evil 2, though that's not really the case, especially considering some monster redesigns are a complete breath of fresh air. The mutated giant G embryos are no longer limited to a single boss and can be found throughout the sewers. Additionally, the new Plant 43's plant zombies that like to drop in on you are much more chilling compared to their lumbering 1998 counterpart that looked like a flailing flower. It's a shame we don't get any new faces like the deformed Lisa Trevor or Crimson Head like in the first game's remake, but this clearly resulted in more attention spent on perfecting and updating all the monsters we've grown nostalgic for. Sadly, no more zombie spiders or moths this time around. Many of us still have warm fuzzy memories of the good old 1990s. 20 year nostalgia cycle anybody? And one of the best parts of the original Resident Evil trilogy is that they felt like a bit of a 1990s time capsule. Remake developers must have realized this because they retained much of the game's 1998 appearance and setting. That, or they didn't want to disturb the already extensive timeline. Check out our timeline videos for the full rundown. Now, we don't see any frosted tip hairstyles or hear any limp biscuit on the soundtrack, but we do see dated computer technology, a dearth of smartphones, and a meticulously designed motorcycle for Claire based on the 1998 Harley Davidson Night Train. Okay, so everything looks different, but how different does the remake feel to play? Well, the most obvious change is the control scheme. Classic Resident Evil games are often critiqued for their tank controls. The original Resident Evil 2 employed this control style with a fixed camera, where a character moves relative to where they're facing rather than the camera's perspective. A player can pivot their character left and right, but always presses up to move forward. Some feel these controls are far too clunky, that they drastically limit movement and add unnecessary difficulty. It's not exactly easy to maneuver around hordes of zombies when you can barely run and turn at the same time. However, fans of classic Resident Evil argue that these controls are designed to work intuitively with a fixed camera perspective. Additionally, somewhat stiffer controls add to the feeling of tension and claustrophobia that should be experienced in a survival horror game. Regardless, many felt it was time for an update. At one point, the Resident Evil 2 remake developers considered using the classic tank controls with a fixed camera. They even tried first-person controls a la Resident Evil 7. Ultimately, the team decided on a third-person, over-the-shoulder perspective with controls similar to Resident Evil 4, 5, and 6. This over-the-shoulder perspective certainly gives the player more mobility and is a logical update, but sorry early adopters, the third-person perspective means no virtual reality this time around. As far as aiming, the original Resident Evil games allowed you to pivot your aim left or right, but limited your vertical aim to a lot locked up, forward, and down position. Now, Leon and Claire have full analog control over their aiming reticle like in more recent titles. This reticle will start to focus in on a target when remaining still, but whenever you move your character or shoot, the reticle's range will dramatically widen, forcing the player to momentarily stop if they want precision. Let me tell you from experience, this adds a lot to the tension and your sense of panic when forcing yourself to stop and steady your aim while a monster closes in. If this new scheme sounds too terrifying for some players, don't worry. There's an auto-aim option available for those who want a less frantic experience. Easier controls doesn't mean that all control-based tension within the gameplay is eliminated. Weapons now have a slower, weighted feel to them, and your field of view while aiming is very limited. Limited sight is a recurring theme in the remake. As previously stated, the original featured fixed camera angles which often let you see the whole room in a wide security camera type view, albeit occasionally hiding enemies just out of sight. In the remake, however, the over-the-shoulder perspective creates a bounty of blind spots for zombies to sneak up on the player, and nothing limits sight quite like the lack of light. The remake shuts down the electricity that was still running through the RPD in the original game. The player is forced to use their flashlight to see their surroundings in the dark. It all feels stunningly realistic and unsettling with the game's dynamic lighting. Although sight is more limited, sound most definitely is not. The sound design of the remake is top notch, featuring spatial audio that lets you hear when a zombie, or Mr. X, is approaching behind or to the side of you, and tells you approximately how far away they are. Once a zombie is in your sights, the precision-based action kicks in. 
the ideal weak spot of a zombie isn't necessarily limited to the classic headshot. You can shoot a zombie's legs to strategically cripple the monster closing in on you, forcing it to crawl. Or you can blow off its arms. Try to chase me through a door now, corpsey. Weapons are more easily upgradable this time around, with multiple attachments to each gun scattered throughout the varied map. Not only do the guns feel upgraded, but the combat knife now has more utility than in the original Resident Evil 2. You still slash enemies at will, but it can now be used as a defensive weapon. You can launch it into an enemy as they latch onto you, preventing a nasty bite. Combat knives now have lower durability, but many can be found throughout the game along with defensive flash and fragmentary grenades. Overall, dynamic fast-paced gameplay hasn't exactly been classic Resident Evil's selling point, but the remake does everything it can to add realistic feeling shooting mechanics that greatly add to the game's depth of strategy. And when they're pulled off effectively, you feel like a zombie slaughtering badass. Look, you can shoot and kill zombies in a lot of different games. How about the stuff that makes Resident Evil, Resident Evil? Inventory management, exploration, puzzle solving, and efficient weapon use are all vital to surviving a classic Resident Evil game. It appears that most of these genre-defining mechanics weren't ignored two decades later. Our protagonists are still stricken with a limited inventory on their person and must rely on mystical item boxes to store their beloved loot. However, in the remake, players can find various hit pouches throughout their journey to expand their inventory two slots at a time. Admittedly, the ability to eventually carry a full arsenal with you eases the tension, but you never have enough of an inventory to carry everything you want. Limited ink ribbons were essential to saving on typewriters in the original, and this additional level of resource management still remains in the remake, though only on the toughest difficulty. Man, that makes us classic Resident Evil players feel so hardcore. Navigating through the police department and discovering key items was a lot of the fun and challenge of the 1998 original. Those who have mastered the game may think this time around will be a breeze. They know where to go and what to collect in the original RE2, but they're in for a rude awakening with the remake. Although many iconic items remain in the game, they will now mostly be found in completely different locations, making the ideal route through the RPD and the rest of the game a completely new experience to discover. For example, the C4 is now detonated in the western part of the station close to the library, rather than where the helicopter crashed like in the original. Additionally, the statue in the main hall now requires three medals, not one, and opens up an underground passage instead of just giving you the spade key. So much cooler. As for the RPD and surrounding areas themselves, they've been vastly tweaked and expanded. Although much of the map design follows the same general layout, so much is added that even seasoned veterans will have trouble keeping their bearings. All those years of memorizing the classic for nothing. There are even brand new puzzles you'll need to tackle to accomplish tasks like restoring power or eliminating Plant 43. And a final nice new puzzle touch is the portable safes, which are a blast to crack in and of themselves. So I've been blabbering long enough, what do you think? Has the Resident Evil 2 remake improved on the title in virtually every way, or do you still prefer the classic over 20 years later? Make sure to tell us in the comments and let us know some changes you noticed that we didn't mention. For more Resident Evil chills, check out our Resident Evil timeline on the first three titles in the franchise. And be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell to keep updated on our latest videos. I'm Marcus, signing off for the leaderboard, your home for video game facts.